thank you for coming out. Um, this is part of the Institute of Catholic Studies lecture series. Um, we have a series of lectures that are both international in scope and that are also um, touching on subjects of, in uh, Cleveland. And this is the first lecture, which is basically an overview of um, the history of the Catholic Cleveland. Um, Dr. John, oh, let me start out with, there's a lecture in two weeks, which will be the Jesuit Martyrs of El Salvador, Perspectives on the 25th Anniversary. That'll be on Thursday, November 13th, right here in this room, with Dr. Michael E. Lee. Um, so let's talk about tonight's lecture. Tonight, we have Dr. John Grabowski, who holds a joint position as Kruger Mueller Historian and Vice President for Collections at the Western Reserve Historical Society and also the Kruger Mueller Associate Professor of Applied History at Case Western Reserve University. In addition to teaching, he serves as the editor of the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History, which is the most used resource for Cleveland online history. In his spare time, he has served as senior Fulbright lecturer at Bill Kent University in Ankara, Turkey. All I know is that Dr. Grabowski is the go-to guy for Cleveland history. <laughs> Dr. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. I, I, I think my mic is on here. Can, can you hear me? I'm gonna, I, I, I will wander. I'm sort of a peripatetic lecturer. Uh, several things. Uh, LeBron's agent is outside wondering why you're here <laughs> and, and not downtown. Uh, really, thank you for being here. This is a, maybe I, should, I can talk about CYO basketball leagues while I'm here. That, that might be appropriate. Um, but I have, I, I, and, and this, this is not a comedy routine, I swear. Uh, but I do have a confession to make before I start, and I think it's appropriate to do this. Uh, my field as a historian is immigration, ethnicity, and sort of the politics of memory. And I'm not really focused on what I would call Catholic or Catholic institutional history. I am Catholic by birth, seriously lapsed. If somebody wants to do something about that tonight, they can have a shot at it. Uh, but I, I do this because Catholicism is so closely linked to my own field, which is immigration and migration. And I do it also, and, and here comes the, the only advertisement you have. Uh, several years ago, uh, we had an exhibit, uh, Vatican Treasures at the Western Reserve Historical Society, and I was asked to author a short book about the Catholic community in Cleveland. And so my expertise was, was gained rapidly while putting this book together. Uh, we printed 30,000 copies. Uh, Professor Marion Morton had been worried we're gonna run out of them. I can tell her that we're not going to. Uh, but to get serious, let, let me begin by looking at the title of this. Uh, and, and you may think that my typing is terrible, uh, but diverse but Catholic with a small C, and I put a little underline under that, uh, with a question mark, because to be Catholic is to be universal. And, and the question is, is whether there was universality within Catholicism in Greater Cleveland. And, and that's a topic I, I want to explore. There are two major themes here, and that is the diversity of the Catholic experience in Northeastern Ohio, and the degree to which Roman Catholicism became, in the 1880s and remains today, the largest single denomination in our region. That was something really not to be expected. And there are a lot of stories about American and international history that are interwoven that shape the Catholic community here. This could be another bad joke here, but this is Moses Cleveland, uh, the person who, after whom the city is named. He was the uh, leader of a group of surveyors who were agents. He was an agent of the Connecticut Land Company. It's a long story about the Connecticut Western Reserve. Again, another lecture, but what we have to understand is Moses Cleveland's roots were in England. His family's roots were in England. His immediate roots were in New England. Uh, he was a Protestant. And every one of the surveyors, save for one who came out to survey the territory, were Protestant. We think one of them may have been Catholic. We're not sure. And, and that gets to what I would call the religious roots of the community. Interestingly, uh, this Connecticut Western Reserve was part of the Connecticut's colonial claims, but you have to go back to what, what is happening with Connecticut and, and the colonies and, and what is happening. There are several Americas during the colonial period. There's French America, 
which is Catholic. There is Spanish America, which is Catholic, and then there is the British, uh, the British colonies, which are largely Protestant. We can talk about Maryland, we can talk about Catholicism in Maryland, but the colonies were pr primarily a Protestant uh, set of uh, communities and, and, and the religion, if you would, of, of, Protestant, of New England, of, of colonial America was largely Protestant. And so when Moses Cleveland came to the city, he put a cultural and religious stamp on it. Uh, and I look at the cultural stamp, if we look at Cleveland's public square, this is 1832. Uh, the, the queue is over here if you want to go. Uh, this, this is Superior going west, but we have a public square. And if you know northeastern Ohio, we have public squares everywhere. And the main church, on each there's a church on each public square, and it's not Catholic, is it? No. It, is, it is Protestant. So we're looking at the religious imprint that first came here was Protestant. Now, that neglects 10,000 years of Native American history and the way they worshiped. And it also neglects something that I find quite interesting. Some of the first accounts we have of life in this area before European settlement come from Jesuit missionaries. The Jesuit relations talk about this area. And we know that there were French missionaries in here. So one could argue that perhaps the first European religion that came into the region was Catholicism via the French. That's a minor blip. It is a Protestant community. Ask my wife, that's her background. That's another story. <laughs> and, and what we see, if we go back to this slide, in creating this landscape of a public square and replicating New England, one could argue that Moses Cleveland and the surveyors expected the Connecticut Western Reserve to become just like the towns they knew in Connecticut, largely Protestant, uh, largely derived of people derived of English or British heritage, if you will. Uh, and that changes, though. And the change is, is, is relatively rapid. It is relatively spectacular. And the change is impelled by the growth of Cleveland. Again, it's, it's something we, we need to talk about. As to, you know, why do we become a Catholic country? I've just talked about Cleveland established in 1796. Absolutely no growth for the first 20 years. It was a poor real estate investment for the Connecticut Land Company. Um, and, and then when it began to grow, it grew slowly. So if you look at the population of the city in 1820, it is 606. Now, that's bad speculation. <laughs> the point, though, is, is that the reason that the Connecticut Land Company, Moses Cleveland, chose the site is they thought it had potential, and its potential was waterborne. Uh, they saw it as the river and a port on a great lake. They saw the potential of connecting the river systems from Lake Erie to the Ohio River and creating a transport route. When that did occur, and it occurred with uh, the completion of the Ohio and Erie Canal, this is an 1859 photograph showing the canal in, in the flats, the community changed rapidly. So the population by 1830 is over 3,000. By the eve of the American Civil War, the population is over 40,000 people. And of that 40,000 people, two thirds are of foreign birth or parentage. Now we come into one of the favorite stories of, of Irish Americans in Cleveland. That is when the canal was built, many Irish had been active building another canal, the Erie across Lake Erie across Lake Erie, right, this great canal, across New York State. And this was the beginning of, of a large-scale Catholic Irish, not Scottish Irish, immigration to the United States. And it precedes the Great Potato Famine. There were Irish coming in substantial numbers to be navvies or diggers on infrastructure projects, as we would call them. When that was completed, some of them migrated to Cleveland, the Cleveland area, and began to get jobs on digging the Ohio and Erie Canal. Uh, that canal was completed in 1832 and started in 1825. So you begin to see a population of Catholic Irish arriving within a largely Protestant community. You begin to see, and we'll go into this later, that the Diocese of Cincinnati, actually it was Bardstown, Kentucky, and then Cincinnati, begins to see that by the late 1820s, there are hundreds of Catholics in Northeastern Ohio. They begin to send priests to travel and minister to that population. We'll look at the rapidity of the growth. The question I will have later is, is what is the relationship between Catholics and Protestants? We, we don't know. We can speculate. 
And, and one of the things we speculate on is that there is a cultural memory in these communities of the Reformation and of the counter-reformations and of the conflicts in Europe. There is a colonial memory among Protestants of the contention with Catholic France and Catholic Spain. Where their memories, the, these, these cultural memories are there. So when Catholicism begins to enter this largely Protestant area, there are frictions. Love this picture. There's not a bar in sight. You have to look closely, though. There are enough Catholics here by the 1830s to uh, do away with the fact that, that there needs to be simply a traveling priest and to create a, uh, a church. And, and this is the church. The picture's taken in the 1880s just before it was torn down. It's known as St. Mary's in the Flats. And it was indeed in the Flats. And I, I would argue that the, the Flats at that time is becoming, it's not industrial, but it's busy. It's warehouse. It's not the best land, the best place to be is on the hillside on Public Square and around. So the, the church is down in the flats. Its, uh, its initial congregants are Irish and, and beginning as Cleveland begins to grow in, in the 1830s. And the church, I believe, is 1837, if I remember correctly, when it is erected. Uh, as the city begins to grow, Germans are beginning to come into Cleveland. And the Germans come not simply as Catholics, and we'll look at them, but, but as Catholics and Protestants. So you begin to have a bifurcated Roman Catholic congregation arriving in the city. That has consequences. Just want to be a bishop here. It gets to be a lot of fun. All of this is occurring in the 1830s, which are a very interesting time in terms of attitudes toward diversity, as we would call it, in religion or background in the United States. And in 1835, uh, this man, who is Samuel F. B. Morse, we all think of him as the, te telegra the inventor of the telegraph. You have to realize that Samuel F. B. Morse was an artist. And he studied abroad. And one of his seminal experiences was being in Rome at a point, and he's Protestant, uh, studying art, and, and one of the hierarchy is brought through, and he does not bow down. And uh, he is abused slightly for doing this, and he is obsessed, in a way, with anti-Catholicism. So he writes a bestseller of the time, The Foreign Conspiracy on the Liberties of the United States. And essentially, it, it, it begins to play this anti-Catholic theme, that the Catholics cannot be trusted as good Americans, a, because they owe their total allegiance to the Pope in Rome, and B, that unlike Protestants who elect their own uh, ministers and govern their own pre uh, parishes, uh, they are subject to the priest and that they cannot think independently. This is something some people in the audience, not the students will remember, was reverberating in 1960 when John Fitzgerald Kennedy was running for president of the United States. Would he be obedient to the Constitution, or would he be obedient to the religion of his forefathers? It's an interesting situation. So he writes this book, and we know it was sold in bookstores in Cleveland. And then you get, a year later, one of the most scandalous pieces of anti-Catholic literature published in America, The Awful Disclosures of Mariah Monk. Mariah Monk claimed to be a fugitive ex-nun who escaped from the Mont Dieu, uh, uh, congregation in Montreal. Uh, and, and she wrote a book which has all the salacious things that were tossed about, about Catholics at that time. Celibate priests and nuns consorting with another, one another, babies being born secretly and buried in, with, within the, the area, uh, within, within the monastery at that point. And, and this is a bestseller as well. So this, this is confronting Catholics in Cleveland at this point. We, we do know, though, that, that there was some degree of acceptance. When we look through the newspapers at this time, we know that when Father Dillon, who was the first permanent priest in Cleveland, dies, his funeral is attended by both Catholics and Protestants. That indicates there's, there's some distance there. Other, other editorials, other newspaper articles will indicate that 
We don't mind the Catholics as individuals. What we have a problem with is their hierarchical religion as a whole. So there's kind of a divorce. It's, it's, you, can, you can paint this black or white, but there's a center ground that we're looking at. But the community is growing. It's growing so quickly that by 1847, the Cincinnati Diocese is divided. You'll see the whole chart of the division, and the Cleveland Diocese is created. There were enough Catholic here to warrant the creation of a diocese. And the first bishop is Amadeus Rapp, served from 1847 at the erection of the diocese to 1870. He has a very interesting tenure as bishop, which I'll get into later. It's not my intention to name every bishop in the history of the city of Cleveland. Uh, you'd miss the end of the game if I did that. The, uh, the point, though, is that by 1852, uh, he's been ministering as a bishop from 1847 to 1852 in that small church that you saw down in the flats. And in 1852, the Catholics come out of the flats and under the top of the hill, and they begin to build their cathedral. It's consecrated in 1852, St. John's. We know that today at 9th and Euclid. Uh, I could argue that 9th and, uh, 9th, 9th, 9th and Superior I could argue that Ninth and Superior is at the very edge of the city. So Catholicism is still on the fringe, but maybe I'm being paranoid about that. Uh, and so he's, he's ministering to a changing community, and, and he has issues. As the German and as the Irish population grow, the Germans are a little problematic. Uh, they would like a priest who speaks not only English, but German. It would be nice if their confessions could be heard in a language they could speak. It would be nice if sermons could be preached in a language they should speak. Amadeus Rapp, like other bishops coming from Europe, is, has been used to working in what I would call sort of a monocultural milieu. You're not in Europe anymore, you're in the United States. And that is the story of Catholicism in the United States, a diversity of Catholics from all over the world. And that creates huge complications for bishops who want to run things like they used to be. That's the uh, cathedral. This picture is 1859. How many of you know the cathedral today? Think it's the same building? It is. And that's, uh, I think it was Bishop Hoban who did the rehab on, on the brickwork on the outside. Uh, Fast, but, but the Catholics are now visible, very visible in the community. And the linguistic diversity I was talking about, this is essentially, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing cultural stereotypes, so I had to find a picture of Germans in a beer hall. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that relates to other issues that, that, that people, not just Catholic, coming from Europe, had in a Protestant New England community. For the Germans, Catholic or Protestant, Sunday was the Sabbath. You went to church, but after the Sabbath, what you would do is go out and have a picnic. For my wife's ancestors, I always pick on my wife, who are Protestant, uh, you went to church on Sunday, and you spent the rest of Sunday at home reading the good book. And so watching Germans drinking beer on picnics on Sunday in Cleveland was somewhat problematic for old line Protestants. Uh, as they became wealthier and as merchants and, and railroads were run, they had no problem of their own. If they were business owners, would you run the railroads on Sunday? What did you do on the Sabbath on Sunday? It becomes a very interesting. And they eventually get their own parish, St. Peter's. So it's split. So you have St. Mary's in the flats. By, by the time Bishop Rapp leaves, I forget how many parishes there are, but there are at least 16 Catholic schools at that point. Uh, what is now St. Vincent's, uh, Vincent's Hospital has been established in 1865, and there are orphanages that have been established. The Catholic infrastructure is growing. That's a rather short period of time. He's followed by two bishops who are quite interesting because they deal with this enormous growth of Cleveland. Uh, and Bishop Richard Gilmore is a convert. He's a Scots Presbyterian who becomes a Catholic bishop. And Bishop Ignatius Horstman is, yeah, German. So one of the issues you have if you're looking at the Catholic hierarchy, not just in Cleveland, but across the United States, as immigrants who are not German, who are not Irish come in, they begin to see the hierarchy supposedly dominated by Germans and Irish. They don't see themselves there. I would argue that if one wants to know why Bishop Pilla was so popular, it's because he was Italian. 
So you begin, this, this, it's a, I find this fascinating. These are great pictures. Some charts now, this is the tedious part of the lecture or discussion. This whole area was encompassed in the, the, the uh, Diocese of Bardstown, Kentucky in 1808. By 1821, there's enough Catholic, Catholic growth west of the Alleghenies to create another diocese in Cincinnati, which encompasses Cleveland. Uh, mere 26 late years later, it's Cleveland. And then if we go on, as Cleveland grows as a Catholic community, Toledo is split off. And then later, 1943, this is an interesting date, di Youngstown Diocese. So you're beginning to see a huge influx of, of Catholics into Cleveland and Northeastern Ohio and Ohio. It's interesting because I would say, you know, the story of, of, of Catholicism in Cleveland is a story of immigration. The story of Protestantism in Cleveland is a story of immigration. The story of Judaism in Cleveland is a story of immigration. These are non-indigenous religions that come here. More interesting, and I brought this up to date because I have a, another slide that if you're looking at the percentage of foreign born, I can't tell you how many of these people are Catholic. The United States Census does not ask people to tell us what their religion is. So one has to speculate, one looks at diocesan statistics, but if you look at Cleveland's percentage of foreign born immigrants, you're looking at a community that until 2000 really is, is above the national average. And that's where it comes and that's where the diversity comes from. Here are the diocesan figures as closely as we can put them together. 1882, single largest denomination in Cleveland. I should say in 1883, Cleveland gets its first Catholic mayor, Honest John Farley. Irish? But you begin to see these numbers and current, this is current as of 2007. Uh, this is the diocese. What you have to remember that is that this time the diocese is shrinking. It's being split up, but it's still growing. Those are incredible figures. And when you begin to see the creation of churches, the preferred method for the church is to create new parishes on a geographic basis, where there are more Catholics, where they need to walk to church, and and not defined by ethnicity. What begins to happen in Cleveland and other cities is this multitude of different parishes. I've just picked some of them. You, you could go through the list. And, and uh, so, you know, St. Patrick, you could read it as well as I can. St. Wenceslaus, the first Czech parish. And what you're beginning to see here, if we go back to this slide, beginning in the years after the Civil War, the migration patterns to cities like Cleveland shift, that is, predominance goes from being from northern and western Europe to a predominance from southern, central, and eastern Europe. It's what we call the Ellis Island immigration. So the diversity is just increasing. And not all of these immigrants are Catholic. Some are Jewish, some are Protestant, uh, some, some are Orthodox, but the bulk are Catholic. And that's why you get to St. Anthony, uh, sorry, don't, that's Cleveland's first Italian parish. You, you know it today as St. Marin's Parish on Carnegie Avenue next to the Aladdin Bread Company? Really? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, and uh, what, what you're finding here is, is some really interesting issues here. And we're going to get into uh, this one and uh, this one in a little bit. Now, how many of you are Slovak ancestry here? How many are Magyar? Okay, so let's look at some of the churches and, and tell some stories about conceptions and misconceptions ab about Catholicism. This is a Holy Rosary. It is not the first church. It is the second church for the Italians in Cleveland. It is created as Little Italy begins to grow in the 1880s. The foundation of, the, not the structure, but the parish is 1892. Uh, one wants to think that all of Little Italy is Italian. But it wasn't. There were a group of Protestant Italians, Waldensian tradition. There, some, some were converts, some came as Protestants. There's a little church down the street on Murray Hill Road. I do a little tourism here. It's, it's now, I think, an art shop next to Murray Hill School. Uh, at St. John Beckwith 
uh, Memorial Presbyterian Church. It established there. There was an, a lawyer in Little Italy named Giuseppe Zottarelli, and he published a newspaper at the turn of the 20th century called La Nuova Luce, The New Light. It's anti-Catholic, pro-Protestant. So go figure, it becomes really quite interesting. Let me confuse this even more. Tremont, Tremont, as we call it today, uh, St. August, Augustine Parish, Irish, one of the first churches there. Tremont, you, you all know Tremont fairly well. It was defined by, in a social study in the 1930s as a community of spires and smokestacks, factories and church spires. And, and if you want to look at Catholicism in Tremont, well, there's one church, we'll get, there's another church, St. John Cantius, uh, Our Lady of Mercy, that's there as well. Uh, you, you, could, you can go a little bit further and you can find uh, St. Ladislaus uh, around the corner. Uh, let me go back to Tremont. So it, there's, there's Catholicism all the way through Tremont. And, and these are churches that are on that, they're not cheek by jowl, but you can walk from St. John Cantius to uh, St. Augustine Church in no time at all. Uh, there, there's just this proximity, and this is kind of why, because different ethnicities. There are conflicts within the church, and I'm gonna go back to another slide. Uh, this is where I get into Magyars and Slovaks. When they, uh, they first came to the Cleveland in large numbers beginning in the 1880s, early 1880s, uh, they, they, they shared that one half of Austria-Hungary that was Hungary. They didn't share it with full love toward one another. The Magyars tended, get myself in trouble here, to, to oppress, there's Magyarization going on, oppress the Slovaks. But when they came to Cleveland, they, they settled together. Why? Because they could speak to one another. They shared a neighborhood. See, other trick about Cleveland's neighborhoods, they are created where the immigrants can find work, where the factories are. So they will work in a factory, but they need to walk back and forth to work. So their homes are around there, their churches are founded in that area. So you, when you go down to Lower Buckeye, you find St. Elizabeth's, which is very close to the railroad tracks and all the factories that used to be down there. That's the definition of these, these neighborhoods. But they worshiped together at first because there weren't many of them. They needed one another. But as their population grew, the old frictions arose and they split. And so that's why you end up with one Slovak church and one Catholic church from a congregation that was together. There's an incredibly interesting story in this. There's a lot of contention in these congregations. Let me go back again. Who is the one to the left of St. Elizabeth? Uh, this would be St. Ladislaus, I believe, the first one. I kind of like that. Okay, can I, may I tell family stories here? Is that permitted? And whose family? Uh, it's, it's, it's all of our families in one way or another. This is uh, St. Stanislaus Roman Catholic Church. It lost its steeples in a windstorm in 1909, one of the most magnificent structures in the diocese. Uh, it's a story I didn't know. I was brought up in Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish. Anybody from Immaculate Heart of Mary? Lansing. Lansing, on Lansing. So you, you know this, do you know the story here? This, this parish was ministered to uh, by Father Anton F. Kolosiewski. He, he came in and, and he had grandiose ideas. And, and he built this church in the early 1880s at a cost of over a quarter of a million dollars at that time. Uh, some stories, this is one that's really tough to, st uh, to sort out. Some stories indicate that the bishop had no idea of what was going on there. I, I tend not to believe that. The more believable story is that when they finished the building, they had a magnific magnificent church, but they had a huge debt. Some of the parishioners dearly loved Father Kolosiewski. The other parishioners wanted him gone. And there were actual struggles in the church. There was contention. And the bishop finally removed Father Kolosiewski. He exiled him to Syracuse, New York, told him not to come back. And, and Father Kolosiewski's friends, his acolytes, uh, the people who liked him in Cleveland, wanted him back, so he came back. And he established a church on Lansing Avenue called Immaculate Heart of Mary, which immediately became a schismatic parish. The parishioners and the priests were excommunicated, and they were only brought back into the diocese, into the church in 1908. 
Now, that's an interesting story. And you find this in a lot of ethnic parishes, struggles over who should be the priest or, or, or how the monies are run. Things are happening in churches in the United States that couldn't happen, didn't happen in European churches. I'll get into a few of them. Uh, this was... Uh, St. Mary's has, Macintyre Mary has its own cemetery in Cuyahoga Heights. They were going to be buried in, Cuyah in Calvary Cemetery. Uh, that's where Kolaszewski is buried. There are stories that old timers would tell me years ago in the neighborhood that, that when a funeral procession was going from Immaculate Heart of Mary out down Marceline Avenue, which is now 71st Street, to the cemetery, that the acolytes, the, the, the champions of, of St. Stanislaus, would call them traitors. And they would turn around and shout back, Romans, Rimji. <laughs> now this gets into another issue because the, 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 many of the polls, we built this church, why should we own the church? Why should the diocese own the church? And so you get the birth of the Polish National Catholic Church, which is totally, there's a lot going on here. There, there are millions of, St. Prokop, Czech church, uh, the parishioners barred the door to the priest one day. <laughs> now what's happening? What's happening to the hierarchical relationship that exists in Europe? This is something I, I want to understand better. This is something that deserves more study. But we've all grown up in churches that, that had church consuls. You know, it's more than solidarity. You, you, you have lay people taking an active role, even pre-Vatican II, in the church. And, and so what is a foreign-born priest to do when his American-born parishioners who are voting if they are citizens, who are becoming more democratic, want to say in running the church. I, I'm, I'm arguing that there's a possible tension there that needs to be looked at. And, and, and when you do sometimes get priests who are really liberal and in favor of their parishioners, they run up into an issue with, sometimes with the bishop. I just had a student at Case Western Reserve the complete a doctoral dissertation on Catholic labor colleges in Buffalo and Cleveland, Ohio. And, and the labor colleges in many ways were, were not things that were pushed by the top of the church, but by parishioners and, and priests who were working for what we would call social justice at that time. Just, just, this is a story that just needs more exploration. <coughs> As the community grows, you begin to get Catholic social services. One of the things that Bishop Rapp does is he begins to bring in uh, Catholic religious communities to, to teach in the schools, to minister in the hospital. So you get Catholic women religious coming into Cleveland. And, and so the Catholic infrastructure grows. It grows beyond the hospital. It will grow to other institutions. It grows the schools. And we'll get to the schools in a while because there's another really good story here. Uh, this is St. Vincent Charity Hospital. Even though it's a Catholic hospital, you know, Anybody ever, why do we need a Catholic orphanage and a Catholic hospital? Any, any thoughts? Any? Yeah. Is it a Jewish hospital or a Protestant hospital? Say, yeah, Jewish hospital, Protestant hospital. You know, what, 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 you know if you're a Jew and, and you go to a uh, Protestant hospital, uh, you know, can you get kosher food? Uh, if you're Catholic and you go to a Protestant hospital, will somebody try to convert you? There was a real fear of, of, of conversion and proselytization that was going on. So you get to get these parallel systems, even old age homes. Little Sisters of the Poor, Jewish Home for the Aged, Menorah Park, the uh, Amethyst Stone Home for Aged Protestant Gentlewomen. I love that one. And this, but this is St. Vincent's, and it's a Catholic institution. The people in this hallway shot in the 1930s, not necessarily all Catholic. They ministered to the community. And that's one of the things we'll get into. St. Anne's Hospital and Infidel. I don't know. I don't know. Jewish doctors didn't get privileges at Protestant hospitals. That's why Mount Sinai was built. So there's, this is a very interesting world that the students aren't used to, but existed. Uh, this is just a great picture of, of foundlings, okay, at St. Anne's uh, uh, Hospital and Infant Home. And this is something Dr. Marion Morton could talk about more, but it's just a great picture of bassinets everywhere and nuns at the side. Catholic education, legacy born in controversy. My favorite Thomas Nast cartoon. If you can't see it closely, uh, this, this is the, the public school which is on the precipice about to fall into the ocean. 
Uh, there's St. Peter's vaguely in the distance. Uh, there's the schoolmaster protecting the kids from, these are all bishop's miters, they're, they're crocodiles. This is an issue, this is, this is a very, very interesting issue. Um, and, and I can say one side is right, one side is wrong. The, the point is, is that Catholics, when they come to the United States, uh, if they know if they send their child to a Protestant school, there will be Bible reading, and the Bible being read there is the King James Version of the Bible. They understand that the American public school system is essentially a Protestant institution. They are fearful for their children's faith. They're fearful for proselytization. And so that's one of the reasons the parochial school system grows so rapidly and is so necessary. But the, 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 the rub to this is, is really quite interesting. Uh, the church in Cleveland, if you, if you send your child in the 1870s, 1880s, if you're Catholic and send your child to a public school without permission of the bishop, you can no longer receive communion. Wow. This happens across. And so Catholics are looking at their tax bills. They say, well, we're paying taxes for public schools. We should be able to get part of the taxes to pay for our own schools. We don't want to be in those schools. And, and this is why the issue is enormous. It, it becomes a presidential plank in the 1876 election for the Republican Party that no public money shall be given to parochial education. And the Catholics are vociferous about this, and the Protestants are equally vociferous uh, about uh, the, the school division. Uh, and, and there's one man in Cleveland who is just... Uh, let me, the word interesting is very interesting, if you think about it. Uh, his name is Edwin G. Cowles. He's a newspaper editor of the Cleveland Leader. It's a strong Republican newspaper, anti-slavery, very liberal, but hugely anti-Catholic. And, and if you read the Cleveland Leader under Cowles' editorship, he excoriates Catholicism. And the particular, his bete noir is the school system. And he's the man who successfully argues for that plank to be inserted in the 1876 Republican platform. It's, it's a hot topic. Frankly, I went to public school. I was jealous because the Catholic kids down the street had more days off than we did. Was, <laughs> you, you know the story about that. And so you look at the schools, they're the elementary. This is uh, St. Augustine School. The system goes beyond elementary, applied and vocational. This is at St. Edward's Parish, which eventually would become one of the first African-American parishes. So they, this is the early 1900s, 1920s. They, they taught commercial skills to the students. This is St. Ignatius. This is the foundation. St. Ignatius is both a high school and a college. And the college part is where we're sitting today at John Carroll. Jesuit education in Cleveland. And we'll talk a bit more about that. So you have a parallel system growing up here. Things do change. Now they've got you all upset about division. How do Catholics, how does anybody become American? That's an interesting question. The other interesting question is what just, what is an American? How is it defined? Um, I use this in almost every presentation I do. I have, a, I have a very personal purpose. This is a Polish Catholic baseball team. I'm sure those of you who know the church realize that the Pope was at the World Series last night because the Pope has a deep interest in baseball. I'm not seeing any smiles here, okay. Uh, uh, or, or that baseball was invented in Poland? No. Uh, essentially, as, as the second generation grows up, it begins to be drawn into the American mainstream. And one of the things church schools do, and churches do, is they create sports events and sporting teams and other amenities that are attractive to the second generation. And so that is the Immaculate Heart of Mary baseball team. I told you this was a family. It's just my father. His nickname was Ben Grab a Whiskey. So you can... Uh, <laughs> But that aside, 
Look at the CYO, the Catholic Youth Organization. Why is it there? Because there's the YMCA, which is Protestant. Mm -hmm. The CYO is, is the Catholic balance to the, the, the YMCA. There was a Y in my neighborhood. Never went there. Kind of off limits. Things change. Catholics become mainstream in good ways and bad ways. Father Charles Coughlin, the radio priest in the 1930s, uh, one of the many radicals looking for a solution to the economic malaise in the United States at that point, virulently anti-Semitic. He became more and more anti-Semitic as time went on. But he had a huge audience, Catholics all over the country. It's a typical picture. Cleveland had a radio, not priest, but bishop. Uh, one of the most interesting guys in the history of Catholicism, Northeast Ireland, uh, Bishop Joseph Schrems. Uh, and uh, he, he literally went on the radio. He actually began, he was close initially with Coughlin, but as Coughlin became more over the edge, he abandoned Coughlin. And so Schrems is one of the first bishops you find meeting with the Jewish community in Cleveland. He actually gives a speech, I believe, in public auditorium that, that talks about, that, that begins, to, he, he's talking about what's happening in Germany in the 1930s. He's also blue collar, labor friendly. He, uh, he allows the labor college to be created in Cleveland. He writes letters to employers who are unfairly treating their uh, employees. So he's, he's, he's a very, he's a lot. His letters, I haven't looked at them. People have looked at them, spectacular letters. When he dies, uh, it's part of, of one of the testaments. And this is from a rabbi. Uh, he was another Joseph the Old Testament. All mankind, his brethren, fearless as he was in the defense of principle. So, you know, suddenly within Cleveland, you, th th something's happening. Something's really happening here. This is Cleveland Municipal Stadium. It's 1935. It's the seventh National Eucharistic Congress. It's Catholics from all over the United States coming to Cleveland. And, and what they're doing here, if you see this closely, is they are forming what's called a, they're forming the shape of a monstrance, a living monstrance on, on the field. Now, this is, this is what, public historians do this all the time. Serious historians have this problem. 100 years before this, people were reading Maria Monk and Samuel Morse in Cleveland. In 100 years later, there are tens of thousands, if not 100,000 Catholics in Cleveland, and the hierarchy is coming on private railroad cars. They are parading, they're, they're going down the streets in parades. It, it's, everything has changed. You know, not that everybody loved them, but they were a force, a voting force and a substantial portion of the local population. I love this picture. And then the Catholics go Hollywood. I mean, we can joke about this, but when Hollywood, for whatever reason, begins to look at Catholic themes, whether it's Boys Town or whether it's Bing Crosby going my way in the 1930s, you can say, you can be a cynic saying they're doing that because there's a huge movie audience around the United States that wants to see this. Or you can be more hopeful and say that there's, you know, this, this is a community has an interesting history. I don't know. You know, Boys Town's a fascinating. How many of you have seen Newt Rockne, All-American? That's a fascinating film about football at a Catholic college done just before World War II. So this is, this is what one begins to see happening. And this colors what happens in Cleveland. And I think the Second World War is, is another watershed, not only for Catholicism, but for immigrants and migrants in general, because people who may have grown up in these separate neighborhoods who lived not in relative, not homogeneous neighborhoods, but neighborhoods that were largely Slovak, largely Magyar, so forth, end up in the service, drafted or they join, and, and they're in a barracks with people from all over the country. They, they have a new view of diversity. My usual line when I talk about this theme is they get to travel to exciting places like, you know, Fort Dix, New Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Seriously, when, when they travel and they go around and if they come back whole in life and limb, they have come back transformed 
in the way they see themselves, in the way they see other people. But more importantly, other people see Catholics in the foxholes with them. It's something that happens in all wars. You can go back to the Civil War and the Hibernian brigades that fought in the Civil War or the German Catholics who fought in the Civil War. Uh, there's, there's a perverse togetherness in some way that occurs from deadly combat or just sharing a bunk or sharing a meal. Uh, this, this is, uh, I think, uh, a cultural, social issue that, that is... Fa so what we're looking at here is uh, the veterans of World War II back at St. Stanislaus after a parade firing a salute. And after the war, the city, which was hurt badly by the Depression, uh, is, is, beginning, is beginning to prosper, prosper during the war. And uh, this, is, uh, this is Tremont. And they're building the new structure for Our Lady of Mercy. It's uh, 1948. Tremont's still burgeoning. Tremont is going to change rapidly soon. So there's a lot of investment going on. To <coughs> Other things are happening with mainstream Catholicism. I, just, I just love this picture. This is Transfiguration Roman Catholic Church on Broadway Avenue in what is now Slavic Village. And, and the, the poor guy is playing disc jockey here. Uh, the girl has a poodle skirt on. And I don't know if the sister is teaching dance steps or doing something. I don't know what it is. And, and then the 1950s Catholicism in everybody's living room with Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. Uh, transformative moments. Education at all levels. Uh, I don't know what school is. I couldn't find my caption for this. But there's a sister teaching. This may be at, at St. Stanislaus, maybe a women's class. I'm not sure. Uh, teaching technical skills. The problem is that Cleveland's changing. Since 1921, there has been very little immigration to Cleveland because of immigration restriction. Neighborhoods weren't being renewed with new immigrants at a rapid rate. The second generation was growing up. It was getting itchy. Uh, my, my line usually is when we look at old Cleveland neighborhoods, people talk about the good old neighborhood, which was next to the steel mill, the smelter, the railroad tracks. A nice place to stay, nice place to get out of if you could. And once you begin to have prosperity after World War II and highways, you have an old babka wondering where her son's going to go in that car. And you begin to get the sprawl that creates a broader Catholic community. Catholics don't go away. They go out of the city, but they're in the suburbs. And, and they do have children. And the Catholic school system in the 1960s is just overburdened with people throughout the diocese. my sprawl picture. You can read this as well as I can. Uh, moving to the Heights, Garfield Heights, Maple Heights, not Shaker Heights. Well, the Shaker Heights is there, but I tend to tease with comments. So you have, it, this is happening at the same time there's a different evolution going on in Catholicism and the city of Cleveland. The new migrants to Cleveland are African American. And these are some figures taken from census records. And you begin to see the percentage change going on. African Americans are not predominantly Catholic. So as the city becomes more African American, it becomes less Catholic. But there are black churches. St. Edward's is one. St. Adelbert's becomes another. Uh, Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament is established in 1920 for black Catholics. So there's a change occurring in the city that affects Catholicism and community. Catholic parish established in Huff neighborhood stays there as the neighborhood change. And, and Sister Henrietta Gorse is, is known for the Famicos Foundation. So you begin to see Catholic charitable action working in communities that are not necessarily fully Catholic. She's still active today. She's still active today, yeah. Just, uh, and what's, what's amazing about this, one of the issues, and, and I'll touch on issues, and I'll get to it right now. Uh, Bishop Lennon. Has, has had a difficult time because he, we have a Catholic infrastructure built for 900,000 people in the city. And, and the argument is something had to be done with it. But every time you close a church, you close somebody's memory parish, something their grandparents built. But the argument for not closing the parish is that even though they don't function full anymore, they can still be social service neighbor, uh, centers for neighborhoods around them. It's an issue I think we've all heard. 
how do you repurpose these structures, how do you repurpose this infrastructure for a changing community? And it happens. And it happens, it happens, a lot of this goes under Bishop uh, James Hickey. He's in Cleveland where Cleveland desegregates its schools in 1976. He, he brings in uh, Archbishop uh, Bishop Like, who was the first Catholic member of the hierarchy. Uh, and he, he's outspoken. He knows that, that when the city's public schools begin to bus students around, that parents will be tempted to put their students into Catholic schools. Now, if he could say, that's, that's great, we want more students, but he, he basically says, no, don't change your, students, uh, your child's school simply to escape busing and race. He makes very strong statements. He works with a group of liberals, like-minded people, where the east side and the west side come together on the Detroit Superior Bridge to hold sort of a, a symbolic meeting of the east side, west side, i.e. the west side's white, the east side's black. You can pick that one apart. Uh, very interesting man who heads off to Washington after that. And I think this may be St. Adelbert's. I'm not sure. St. Adelbert's an old Czech par parish which became uh, a predominantly black parish. So there is African-American Catholicism in Cleveland. That's part of it. And you begin to see it in the school systems. Things change. This is the, uh, the staff at St. Benedict School, 1988, 1989. It's diverse. It's changing. And then the newest migration to one of the newest migrations to the United States is, is Latino, Hispanic. And, and the heritage there is not universally Catholic. There are a lot of Pentecostals. There are a lot of uh, Protestants. Uh, so you, you get, you know, get La Sagrada Familia, the parish established on, on the west side. So there is a new ethnic parish going on. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a different, I, I, these are pictures from the diocesan archives that we used in the book. This was a Polish National Catholic Church in Tremont. It is now St. Andrew Kim Korean Catholic Church. So you, this, this is, and where you're also beginning to see this, there is a lot of African migration to the United States, subcontinent of uh, 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 sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, so forth. Many people come as Christians, many of the Christians are Catholics. So St. Coleman's Parish has become sort of a home, a haven for many African migrants, whether they're Catholic or not. So the changing mosaic of immigration and migration to Cleveland fits into the story of Catholicism in many ways, either as worshipers or as people who benefit and work with Catholic charitable institutions. There's a changing image of Catholicism too that I would argue. Uh, it's, it's kind of cool to be Catholic now, right? This is a... St. Stanislaus, and that is Carol Wojtyla. As, as the students called him back in the old uh, Star Wars days, they called him J2P2. Uh, but his persona, his travels, essentially exposed more people to a side of the Catholic Church they hadn't understood. Uh, and, and I think that's what's happening with the current Jesuit Pope. Uh, it's cool to be in a Jesuit school and have a Jesuit pope. Uh, he's, you know, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, he's, he's, he's pushing a changed image of the church. Let me close this by looking at something that, that fascinates me. Uh, you know, and we'll close it with something else that's really self-serving. Uh, this is a, uh, the plain dealer in 1916. Italians hail Feast of the Assumption, August 15th. Uh, Little Italy, how many of you have not been to the feast? Not been, okay. Next year. Uh, this, 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 what amazes me is this is a, one of the most important holy days in, in the Catholic calendar, the Assumption. And, and this is one of the most internally important celebrations for Italians from certain regions. And, and it was an Italian Catholic thing. It is now everybody's there. Now, whether they understand the religious significance of this or whether they care about it being 
an Italian festival because the food there certainly is not all Italian. I don't know where elephant ears ever came from, but that's a different story. <laughs> the, the, the point is, if you go to the feast now, the people there reflect the diversity of the community. Little Italy is Little Italy, but the ball, many of the people who live there are international students who were there. And so when I walk to the feast and I see a Turkish student I know at the feast, and I see you know, a huge number of students now today from uh, People's Republic of China at the feast, it becomes, that's why we wrote the book, There Are No Strangers at the Feast. Now, to what degree this enhances their, their knowledge of Catholicism, I don't know. That's the feast in the old day, that's Holy Rosary. This is a relatively recent picture. Uh, if you watch, uh, the best day to go to the feast is actually when they parade the statue through the streets of the uh, community. That it, it is really meaningful. And, and what I find is, is that some of the young women who accompany the statue of the Virgin Mary are African-American girls dressed up in white with white girls. The Montessori school attracts them there. It's, it's not a perfect world. But this is far different than the community that, that started here as a Protestant community and the, the difficult days where there are huge divisions. It's not perfect yet, whether it ever can be. I like this. The, these are the, uh, the residents of Abington Arms, the home for the elderly down the street. You know, they're, they're, I don't know who they are, but they're parading for the Feast of the Assumption. I'll close with this. Um, this is a very general story that I gave to you. Uh, it, it talks about a, a religion that, that is globally hugely significant, a religion that, that wasn't really planned to be or expected to be in this area, but one that is still now the largest single denomination in the area, and, and an evolution of attitudes within the Catholic Church and outside of the Catholic Church toward Catholicism. Uh, and, and all that is driven by, by the diversity within, within that, that church and also within the community it serves. And, and certain things live on. Um, this, is, um, this is the Slovenian half of my family. These are my, uh, two of my mother's sisters who were getting Holy Communion at St. Vitus Church. And uh, this, this is yours truly before he lapsed. Uh, having his communion. There are these traditions that go on, uh, and, and they may change, uh, but that's sort of what holds it together. Uh, heaven knows where it's going to go because Diane and I have no children, so uh, I'll, I'll close with the story. We got married in a Protestant church. That's my confession. Pilgrim Congregational Church. Uh, standing there at the, at the altar with Diane, wondering what I was doing. That was one important promise. Uh, people commented that there was only one time in the entire service that I smiled. And, and that was the time when they said the Lord's Prayer. And my half of the church said it one way, and my wife's half of the church said it the other way. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Did I speed read this? Do you, do you all want to go watch the game or whatever is happening? No, I'm sorry. Yes, Mike. Um, in the Protestant community, you had people like Samuel Mather and the people that created the steel industries and iron ore. Um, in the Jewish area, you had the garment industry and retail. What did you have in the Catholic community in terms of individuals who amassed wealth and jobs and ownership? Hmm. It's a good question. I'm not really prepared to answer. There are some, and the names are not coming to me. Uh, you, if you will look at some of the early Irish families, you will find them moving into construction building. Uh, I'm looking at John P. Murphy, who was the head of the Higby Company, and the Murphy Foundation is his creation. Uh, there, there are others, but they're, they're eluding me at the moment. And I don't know if I could stereotype them into one community or another. Well, there's, there's um, yeah, there's, there's a story. Uh, the Western Reserve Historical Society, one of my employers, owns something called the Hay McKinney Mansion, built by the uh, widow of John Hay, Lincoln's uh, private secretary and later Secretary of State, never lived in her, uh, but, it, but it was then lived in by Price McKinney, Catholic. Uh, 
Faith Corrigan. There's, there's, there's no, there's Corrigan now. That, that's, but Price McKinney was one of the founders of Corrigan McKinney Steel, one of the biggest steel companies in the United States. And so he lived in this grand mansion only for maybe 10 years or so on East Boulevard in Wade Park and University Circle. I'm sure there were other Catholics there, but he's one that comes to mind. I tend not to, to look for that, but I'm sure they're there. And that's, that's a pretty bad answer for a very distinct question. Other questions? Yes? Would you explain the labor college? Maybe everybody else knows what it is, but I don't. Uh, it's, this is where my, my student, Paul Lubinecki, should be talking to you. Uh, in the 19th century, this could be a long story. I'll try to make it short. In the 19th century, the Catholic hierarchy in the United States had an issue with unionization. They felt that unions were secular bodies that, that might be antithetical to Catholic belief. But in the 19th century, uh, the Pope passed an encyclical called Rerum Novarum, which basically talked about the rights of workers and the way workers should be treated. And, and that opened the door for some of the hierarchy and for many priests to say, you know, how do we educate workers about our rights, their rights? That was buttressed in the 1920s by another encyclical called Quadragesimo Anno, which basically was created at the time that Mussolini was sort of nationalizing everything, and that reified and strengthened what was said in Rerum Novarum. Rerum Novarum was basically a bulwark against increasing socialism in Europe at that time. Uh, the church wasn't really active within the labor movement. A lot of the labor movement was being captured by socialism, so this was a church counterattack. The Catholic hierarchy, some members of the Catholic hierarchy embraced this. And, and priests who worked in parishes where, and very general parishes where there were a lot of working people knew they had issues. And so they began to advocate for them. And the labor colleges were essentially uh, schools, and there's one, there was one at St. John's, there's a couple in Buffalo, where Catholic workers were taught, not just by Catholic clergy, but by Jews and Protestants about how do you organize, how do you negotiate, uh, you know, what are the rights of labor in, in a negotiation uh, for wages? And, and so they were being taught their rights as workers. Uh, you can see this as, as a very liberal thing on the part of the church, or you can see it as co-option to keep this with, within the church and keep the Americans who were suffering in the 30s, in particular in the Great Depression, out of the clutches, my word, of, of socialist, communist, and radical movements. So it was something the church did, and, and the colleges were very, very effective. Yes? How involved was the Catholic Church in the progressive movement the late 19th century? Not very much at all. Couldn't hear the question. How involved was the Catholic Church in the progressive movement of the late 19th century? Largely absent. Really? Largely absent. Uh, you, you begin to see people later, like Dorothy Day and so forth, you know, go into what I would call progressive uh, attitudes. Uh, but you know, the social gospel and you know, Walter Rauschenbusch, that, that, that was the day that the progressive movement was very, very largely Protestant. And that was one of the criticisms of many Protestant progressives that the Catholic hierarchy was not getting behind the movement. But it's rerum novarum that allows some Catholics to begin to move toward that. Again, Paul, Paul is the man to do this. It, uh, this is seven years of his life putting together this <laughs> dissertation. Legislation was being passed. Uh, such, such as? Well, legislation uh, for ch children, child labor laws, and, and the eight hour work, or 10 hour, I guess it's. Uh, I, I don't know specifically where they stood on child labor laws. I, but I, I do know that, that when the negotiations for eight-hour days were coming on, it was led by the Knights of Labor at first. That was a strong movement there. Uh, some of the hierarchy was adamantly opposed to the Knights of Labor. Other members felt that the Knights of Labor were doing good things for the workers. Uh, but when you look at the labor colleges in the 30s in the negotiation for working hours and so forth, that's what they're teaching the workers. Whether the colleges themselves advocate for an eight-hour day or paid vacation, I can't say. But they were training the people in the labor colleges to go back to their cohorts in the factory and teach them how to negotiate uh, uh, these, these changes in contracts. Yes, Paul. Uh, 
First, one observation was that the picture of the municipal stadium where this Eucharistic Congress is going on, and all the jokes I've heard about how the Indians were never able to fill that. It looks like they had more people in the seats that day yeah. than the Indians did for decades. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, the Indians could have used a lot of prayer for decades too, but that's. <laughs> One of the things I think about in terms of politics and every time we come up to an election, you hear some people talking about the Catholic vote or whether there still is a Catholic vote. Um, and given the diversity you describe, it makes me wonder if there ever was a Catholic vote or what you really had was that if most Catholics were working class, there was a working class vote. Um, and now, in fact, you know, we now recognize that there is no Catholic vote today because Catholics are arguing with each other Heather. over any number of issues. Mm -hmm. Was there a Catholic vote at one time? The closest it would come is what, what you, you're suggesting is that during the Roosevelt period uh, and, and the Roosevelt uh, New Deal coalition, uh, a lot of bl blue collar workers who were mostly Catholic would be in that. Uh, what management Catholics would do, I don't know, but that's, that's where it becomes the Catholic vote. But some people still stay outside of that. One of the interesting stories, and I don't know how true this holds, is that the Italian vote uh, tended to stay Republican for a long time. And, and one of the arguments is that what happened is when Woodrow Wilson was negotiating in Paris after World War I, uh, he didn't strive hard enough to give the irredentists in Italy the territories they wanted. So they blamed it not only on Wilson, but the Democratic Party. Uh, that's something I've read. I've never seen it proven. But the Catholic vote was one of those things that began to fall apart during the during the period, uh, what I, not the Reagan Revolution, but you begin to see it crack in the 70s as, as issues of, you know, what morals do, do the Democratic Party support? You know, issues that, okay, fine, there is a lot of cross race, but it also shatters on race. So if you, if you look at, let's say this, Ralph Perk as a Republican running for mayor of Cleveland in, in the 1970s, and Perk is a Catholic, please, Our Lady of Lords. Uh, but Perk is, is the champion of white ethnics. After Carl Stokes, after there's been a move toward the black, after, after there's been, there have been riots in Huff and, and in Glenville. Uh, but he's one of them. And, and so you, you got a lot of ethnic neighborhood support for Perk because of who he was, Catholic and, and Republican. It's, and, and that's, you're right, that's what we see now. I think the social issues that both parties are pushing one way or another are pushing on on Catholic, you know, moral beliefs, and and that's what they're they're playing with at this point. I, I use the word playing, purposely, uh, but no, it's never so, it's never solid. That's that's why it's hard doing this. But the fascinating thing about being a historian is you can pick any generalization apart when you bore down on it. Uh, it can become deconstructionist at a time, and nothing holds. Uh, but it's. Uh, yeah, that's that, that, that vote issue. Uh, and, and many Catholics, many Catholics were adherents to the Democratic Party in the 19th century, uh, basically because of Republicans like Collins, but you also have issues. Uh, you know, the, the Irish were upset with the, with the Republican Party during the Civil War because of the issue of emancipation, slaves, and black competition for labor. You get the draft riots in 1863, and they're firmly, Tammany Hall is an Irish machine. You know, and and, and the party dispenses, you know, if you're asking where Catholic millionaires are, you might look at some people in Tammany Hall. Uh, Cleveland never had a machine like Tammany Hall. Uh, but it's, yeah, uh, that's, it's, it's, hard. it's hard. We recreate these images and uh, get hung up on them. I'll, I'll tell you that there was a Polish vote. I'll do another story. My, my father would come back from voting. He died when I was 16, but I remember the story. And he would turn to my mother and say, well, it was a long ballot today. He said, I voted for everybody who had a Polish last name. <laughs> so I didn't vote for any of that, quote, damn Irish. <laughs> it's just, uh, interesting to see democracy in action in your own <laughs> living room. But these are quips. These are anecdotes. And they need to move beyond anecdotes. What, what we're looking at is transformation of a of city and a society. Thank you. Oh, one more? Can I have two? Uh, yeah, yes. One uh, um, has to do with the nuns, though I guess technically they were sisters, sisters, not nuns. In my adult life now, I'm realizing that these congregations own some of the most beautiful properties in Cleveland, or I should say in Cuyahoga County. Mm -hmm. And I'm remembering from our age, 
I mean, they were paid next to nothing to teach mm -hmm. in those grade schools, yeah. probably high school. How do you think they did it to get those wonderful, wonderful convent grounds? Uh, the church would have had the money to purchase the convent grounds. A lot of those convent grounds would have been in undeveloped territory at sure. that time. You know, if you're looking out, you know, you know, the Ursuline Convent was on the top of the Ursuline, you know, college was on the top of the hill in, in Cleveland Heights, you know, and so the, there was, there was money to purchase and a lot of that was purchased. I would, I think, from the honest. diocese, you think they got help from the diocese? I believe so, yeah. Because if a bishop brought them yeah, in. Well, yeah, York, right, and set said, them up, no. right. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know the intricacies of mm -hmm. it, so I'm beyond my ken to answer that with any authority. But I hadn't thought of that. I was only thinking of now how they ask yeah. money from people, you know, just people. The other thing is, um, if you could, I mean, to do research, I know the diocese has archives, which are varying levels of uh, complete, I mm. would say. But where else would you go if you wanted to research, you know, old ethnic things, churches, old ancestors who were priests, any any of that, where would you go? There, there are a variety, if you're looking locally, there are a variety locally. of places oh, you right, could do right, right. it. Yeah, there, there, are, there, there are a lot of books that, that I haven't used on, on the parish and the diocese uh, that, that you can find at other libraries. The West Reserve Historical Society, this is, is not a parochial. Uh, yeah, it, it's a very good place because we, we collect a lot of the records of ethnic communities. That's, that's what we do there. And there are also, uh, it, there are also uh, a number of what we call church anniversary pamphlets. They're I not know, fully cataloged. I know what those are. Yeah, there 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 are tons of them. Uh, they need to be more fully cataloged. There's there's an incredible collection. It's not very deep, uh, but during the depression, the WPA federal, not the Writers Project, but one of the uh, workers projects, basically created you know, like hundreds of archive boxes with details about businesses, churches, and so forth. So a whole raft of folders that give some background on the history of churches. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it's sketchy notes, some of it are fuller notes, uh, but there are different ways to go. And if you're looking for ancestry, where priests, uh, essentially the, the, the census and other records, uh, you'll begin to find them there and trace back from that. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, but the diocese is basically where everything goes and, and you know, some of the best records are still in individual parishes. Beyond the sacramental records, often parishes will keep runs of their bulletins and other things. We were fortunate. We, obviously, we did not get the sacramental records from St. Stan's. We can't do that. But uh, the late Father Clarence Corgi had a closet full of, of old bulletins and that from St. Stan's, which we, we have. Uh, I'm really proud of that one. It's kind of cool. Are the Spanish communities much more recent, or do they have a long enough? Uh, they're, they're very uh, recent. The, uh, the oh. first, well, the, in terms of, of size and influence, the, the second most spoken language in our region is, is Spanish today in northeastern Ohio. But we were get, we, Mexicans were coming to Cleveland in, 19, in the 1910s. Uh, they worked their way up on the railroads. Uh, Lorraine and Cleveland, they worked in the steel mills. There were small Mexican communities here. There was an old Mexican club on the west side on Detroit called Club Azteca, which was started in the 1930s. But the real movement is post-World War II, and some of it is World War II. Uh, Puerto Rican community in uh, Lorraine uh, was, was seeded by a request from the owners of the United States Steel to the governor of Puerto Rico, Rex Tugwell, to send some workers to help ease the labor shortage during the war. And that begins to spill over. So in the 1950s, you begin to see a Puerto Rican growth in Cleveland. The 1965 immigration law is what changes everything for us as a country because it is no longer discriminatory. It sets an absolute limit. And, and the, if you look at immigration, be here all night. If you look at immigration, you, you need to, there, there, there are three standards, push, pull, and access. Something has to be, forcing somebody, encouraging somebody to leave, to push them out of where they are. There has to be something that brings them to, attracts them to another place. I will argue that usually it's economics. And so the push factors change across the globe. They're very strong in the uh, early 1800s in, in Europe, in Northern and Western Europe. They become strong in Central and Southern Europe in, in the years just after the American Civil War. And those factors now have, have moved to other parts of the world. 
So if you're, if you're looking at you know, Mexico, if you're looking at South America, I mean, the economic issues in Venezuela and so forth, there are push factors that are going on there. And, and the pull factors are they're still, not, not just here, but, but to other places. And access is the ability to get back and forth. I'm fascinated how technology makes us who we are. You know, sailing ships, steamships, and now A3, you know, A380s. Uh, that's, that's what we do. Other questions? You, you had two, is that? No, uh, I, I asked You asked two, yeah. okay. You could, about you could see. One about uh, how we get the yeah, yeah. And I was going to comment on if, you, if you're looking at Catholic women religious, that's one of the most important stories in women's history. And, and sometimes it is looked in as internally. But, you know, when you were asking the question, I was going to say, you know, what motivated these women to do what they did for what they got paid? That, that's uh, the point, you know. And, and how, you know, it's, it's like missionaries, you know, to, to do this and, and to, to build a life. And, and within that, you know, you, 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 you have incredible skills. You have incredible writers. There's an article in the... Uh, Plain Dealer recently about, uh, it is uh, Conversion of St. Paul Church. That's an interesting church at 40th and, uh, and Euclid. And, and she's a painter. She was a painter in her life before she took her vows, and, and now she does these incredible uh, skill sets. Wasn't St. Paul's originally a Protestant church? It was an Episcopal church. It, and uh, then when they became Catholic, they called it the Conversion, conversion of St. Paul. That was really in your face. <laughs> And, and, and the old St. Paul's is now at Fairmount and Coventry. Yeah, that's it that's where it is. It's the only yeah. place in the world where all three orders of Franciscans are housed in one. Really? Yeah. That's cool. The only place in the world. Four Clares, Franciscans, and for the secular order. Second wow. Order. I didn't know that. That's cool. That's, that's really cool, yeah. And it, it's, I, I think there's a beautiful irony that you have the Franciscan parish at 40th and Euclid on what was millionaires' that's right. sandwich between the welfare office. Yeah. Oh, there, right. Yeah, in, in the welfare offices where the Wade family homes were. Right. And, and the Sewer District the sewer headquarters of John D. Rockefeller's right. in town house, right? right? <laughs> and, and the church is where uh, Mark Hanna's uh, daughter married the heir to the McCormick Reaper fortune. Yeah, I, I learn all this trivia over time, but that's more important about the Franciscans being there. Yeah. I see. Excellent. Oh, I don't remember the name of it exactly now, but about the women religious that was at the Jewish. Right, it was yeah, that, that was at Malts, yeah. No, that was negotiated. That was negotiated. That was negotiated. That, that, uh, that's what, are you the, saying the diocese thought it was the place? Oh, to absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was talked about, negotiated. That was purposeful. Mm -hmm. And that exhibit, those women built the entire social service structure in Northern yeah. Ohio. Yeah. And they haven't gotten any recognition. Still here. That's still here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the nuns are still very good at raising money. Mm -hmm. I can still remember coming home one night, one of my best friends walked down in his basement, and everything in the basement was gone. All the furniture. And he walked upstairs. Uh, his dad walked upstairs. Where is the basement furniture? It's in the convent at St. Raven. Yeah. Yeah, they did a marvelous job. Yeah. Just marvelous. Yeah, and your comment about the malts, you know, that puts it out in a community yeah. where a more diverse audience is going to see no it. No question. And yeah. that, that really was a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and it was very, very intentional. Mm -hmm. But that's still here. You can still get access to that. It's not a, a, a beacon. Um, well, no, it's still, there's still yeah. parts of it around uh, that you can, uh, uh, that Catholic choral group still Get you access to it. That's a fascinating, yeah. It's fascinating. Oh, yeah. It really is. Yeah, it's just, uh, there, there's so many stories in this, you know, and I'd, I think I'd, the Turkish word is yeter, <laughs> basta, enough, whatever. Uh, Actually, St. Vitus is now a Catholic inner city African American high school. That's St. Martin de Pours, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You see, you, you touched a nerve. Yeah, my, my mother was kicked out of St. Vitus School. <laughs> so I had, a father, I had a father who drank a lot. My mother misbehaved, so what can I say? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>